Talking about uh, pharmaceuticals, on the Pharmac website listed in the annual review for 2012, it indicated a spend of approximately $70 million per annum on antidepressants, antipsychotics, and sleeping pills. I'm in the wrong business. <laughs> <laughs> Does that sound like good value for money to you? <laughs> I don't know. It's family drugs. How <laughs> many people felt good for that? Or better? Or worse? So the outcomes are so poor that, you know, the recovery outcomes are so poor are using their approach <coughs> that it would seem that it's not good value for money. <laughs> it's not worth it. Yeah, I'd say it's over there. I mean, it, it's, um, in what Philip was saying before about uh, the business opportunities for the drug companies <laughs> and, um, and personal distress, um, they're onto something and they know it. And the um, psychiatric drugs are their biggest income earners. In fact, if you wanted to buy shares 20 years ago and you bought them in drug companies, you'd be rolling them. Right <laughs> they're, the, they're the most profitable countries in the world. Especially <laughs> and. Yeah, antidepressants. And there's, oh, there's a load of antipsychotics going on in old people's homes and everywhere, you know, they, they love their antipsychotics. So the old people don't, the, the staff do. So, so, um, so I think, um, and we know that actually the drugs uh, create more problems than they solve uh, and that they don't actually address the... Um, the underlying issues that people have that uh, their distress is creating, and uh, and it's a very lazy way of um, you know like oh we'll just give them a pill we'll just give them a pill and um, and you know at best it might people might say well that was ten percent of my recovery but you know we've got we've got um, you know a huge amount of resource going into uh, a regime that is remarkably ineffective. How's that for evidence-based practice? You're coming back to the Finnish model, and, and one third of their patients, they only use neuroleptics, yet they have such high rates of success. Yeah. Um, and, and half of those people that are on neuroleptics then are taken off them before they leave the service in Western Footland, and they're having the results um, that's because they are looking at using alternative other approaches first before using medication. They're not saying medication is bad, but they're using it in a limited amount. Yeah, just kind of generally agreeing with what people are saying here, and just to talk from my own experience, because I take Effexor, and it's like, yay! <laughs> but the, the downside is um, when like knowing that it's affecting my liver, but that the time that it will take to come off it will just be so horrendous, I'd have to stop working, there's no, nothing that will cover me for that period. So I'm kind of in this, in this kind of like, oh yes, we can see this is affecting my liver, but I'm going to keep taking it because I actually just cannot come off it and keep my job and da, 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 da. and it's like and it's like all of us are kind of making these decisions that are that are actually just really bizarre decisions to be making, you know. Are you taking liver tea? Liver tea. cleansing tea. Oh no, no, I I uh, good stuff. <laughs> 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 No. To be supported to healthily um, walk through that process where they've become chemically addicted and are going to have withdrawal effects, and there's a huge sensitivity required to actually do that safely. I, I just wanted to, uh, we sit here and it sounds um, pretty defeatist, uh, and I wonder who is out there doing something to counter that. Um, I remember um, about 13 years ago, my brother came from the States to, to visit to, to visit me, and he looked at my daughter and he said, 
if she was in the States, they'd put her on Ritalin. And, um, and he, he's correct. I mean, she just ran around the house. And, um, and, but to me, it was normal because I grew up in an open area in, in Trinidad. And what she was doing was normal. But he spent a lot of his time in America. And, and certainly her, the way she was, she's all right now. She was always all right then, but you know. Uh, <laughs> um, but, and then my, my, um, my other daughter, I liked her to the doctor. He, um, she had a sort of an asthma type thing. And, and um, he, he said, he put her on, wanted to put her on drugs. And I said, why? He said, well, you know, it's smoke inhalation. She hung, along, she hung out with friends, it smoked and all that. I said, well, don't you think the easiest thing would be to tell her to tell her friends to stop smoking mm -hmm. rather than to mm. put on drugs? But, and I, you, you think, you wonder how much in collusion the, the medical professionals are with the drug companies. But just listening to, to everyone, it, it seems as though um, we do not have the resources to counter it because the messages from the media are much more powerful than coming from the other side. And I think, I do not know, I mean, ANC would know better than this, and, and you would too, what is there to counter that? Because it seems to me the, the um, admission of drugs seems to be the, the first recourse that we have. And surely, I mean, had I not been a, a, a fairly well-educated person, I could have put my daughter in Ritalin, I could have given my daughter those drugs, but I knew better, especially since my mother was a health professional. Um, but I, I, I really would like to hear from, from you how we turn this around to challenge and contest. Yeah. That's definitely one of the questions that I have, it's not written down, but also in terms of if you look at the American um, way of doing things in terms of advertising drugs on television and over the radio and the impact that has and the impact that potentially could have on our society as well. I'd like to hear your comments on that. They basically say that you're not successful in America if you don't have a therapist. And so, you know, that they, it's, a ther it's a therapist model. I mean, you know, I, I also studied psychology as well as law and uh, realised that most of the psychologists that were teaching me were probably a little bit more dysfunctional than half their clients would be. But, um, you know, and so I decided not to go into that field. But in America, I would have made a fortune because over there you have to have a therapist if you're going to function successfully at all. And so, you know, I, I think we need to get away from, again, it, it, it might be the pharmaceutical model, but it is still also the medical model. We still medicalise in order to, you know, um, drug. Um, a lot of my whanau, ten, my birth whanau or adoptive whanau turned their back on me for a long time, so I was alone. My whanau came with my friends very close friends for a long time. Now it is with a very good partner and, and again, my son. And, you know, that is how we, we can actually gain our strength. It's within our culture. It's within our identity of who we are. Rely on those things, not on that doctor and not on that drug because that's the thing that ends up becoming our long-term problem. But that's the thing also that takes away the emotion of who we are. If you want to grow and be who you are and be well and be healthy, even in the moments of unwellness, because I do live with depression. There are days when I'm really low and I say to my mate, I don't know why, but I'm depressed. <laughs> and it's just verbalizing it actually takes it away, takes the power away from that, from that whole um, time of depression. Because I don't know why, but they understand, so they just support me until I get out of feeling that feeling again and get back to feeling good again. The American model with the DSM, really, it's about health insurance, right? That's a different medical system that they have where you would need to be diagnosed with something from this psychiatrist's Bible, and then you can access some kind of support. So I know that um, in terms of gender transitions and accessing any kind of medical support in the US, that's it's a really hard battle for people where they're trying to say, oh, on the one hand, we don't want to be pathologized. On the other hand, if we're not in there somewhere, we probably won't get access to anything. Um, so they've tried to settle with, like, the latest DSM-5 has gender dysphoria as something that people can experience and is a treatable problem rather than gender identity disorder as in being gender diverse is itself a problem and you need treatment because of that. So it's trying to take the pathology away from the individual. Um, but we don't even need to use the DSM here, right? Like, why, why are we using that? What's that about? What I mean, it's like... 
That's not helpful. I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> well, Hollywood was about these kids. <laughs> yeah, Miley Cyrus is the DSM. Miley Cyrus. Oh, I didn't say that. <laughs> the, wrong uh, the prescribers have so little on their toolbox that that's all they've got is um, diagnosis of drugs. And they'll throw in a bit of uh, piece of missile. Pessimism if you've got, you know, a really bad diagnosis. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and, of course, the other very sinister line is um, that the drugs are used as a form of um, a way to control people. And I think this is particularly the case in terms of mental health act stuff and antipsychotics. And they're used to control people in rest homes. They're, they're, you know, and then they're not called a chemical straitjacket for nothing. So, so I think the why question is very important. Yeah. I don't think it's the people who live with mental illness that are necessarily numbed by the drugs. I think it's our general society which is actually numbed permanently and, and it's so averse to expressing their own emotion that actually we, we bring everyone into that context of being numb on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, Brittany Brown um, who studies shame and vulnerability talks about numbing and she talks about the use of particularly alcohol and um, what she says is that when we numb the bad feelings we also numb the good feelings and so as a society we do have a cultural norm of being numbed to both good and bad. And I think particularly in Western culture, we have this thing where it's okay, and I actually got this from you, so I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> citing Mary O'Hagan here, we have this thing that you can express emotion between here and here, and that's normal. But if you express emotion from here to here, that's abnormal. But if we flipped it and said, this is normal, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I am I doing it right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if we flipped it and said, this was normal, then that will be abnormal. <laughs> you know, when you go to a tangi, do you notice how Māori grieve, you know? We, we, we wail, and we wail, and we wail, and we, we share our feelings, and then we, we get in there and we have a kōrero about the person, and we'll laugh, we'll cry, we'll get angry, we'll do whatever, and you know, you let everything out. You come away from that tangi, you actually feel quite good. And, you know, that is normal, as Philip was saying, in Māori society, that is normal. And, you know, I think we've got to be a bit more real about life. It's that life is pretty boring most of the time. <laughs> Sometimes it's really cold. Sometimes it's a bit weird. There's but knuckles that piss you off. <laughs> There's great people that make you feel good. And that's what life is about. And we have a romantic notion that life is amazing, like Hollywood, and we fall in love and we do these wonderful, amazing things. And then when that doesn't happen, we think there's something wrong with us. But actually, it's just life. Okay, on that note. <laughs>